Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company. I'm taking a look at some of the guns that are going to be for sale in their upcoming 2016, uh, December of 2016 premiere auction, and also taking a look at some of the blades that they're going to be selling. This is something that I'm sure some people will recognize primarily from reproductions and computer games. This is a Webley revolver with a Pritchard Greener bayonet on it. It's one of the more interesting and unique bladed weapons of the First World War and has a really cool story to it. So it is pretty much what it looks like here. This is a bayonet on a revolver. This was the idea of a guy named uh, Arthur Pritchard. He was a he retired a captain uh, in the Royal Army. He actually enlisted in World War I in 1915, served with the uh, Royal Berkshire Regiment went over to France in 1915, uh, served there until late 1916. Uh, he actually got promoted uh, a couple times, ended up a, a temporary lieutenant when he came back, uh, and after returning to the UK, possibly because he was wounded, probably because he was wounded, um, ended up serving in a, a training unit through, through the rest of the war. And it was during that time in England that he came up with this idea and actually patented it. Uh, the notion, of course, being if you only have six shots in your revolver and you're using this in something like a trench raid, you don't necessarily always have time to reload when you run out of ammunition if you're in a hotly contested fight. And it might be a good idea to have some sort of stabby bayonet implement on the front of your revolver. Now, in total, not, not more than maybe 200 of these total were manufactured. And it appears well, nobody has come up with any definitive evidence that these were actually used in combat. They may have been. Um, they were never officially issued by the, by the Royal uh, Military. They were private purchase items. So if you were an officer, or an enlisted man for that matter, you could buy one of these yourself uh, to carry with you in combat should you so desire. How many people did that? We don't really know. Now there's some, the backstory on this I think is pretty cool. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and take a closer look at this, uh, not just for the backstory, but also because uh, fakes and reproductions of these things are, account for the vast, vast majority of them, and I believe this one is a true, legitimate original. And so we want to take a look at some of the details so you know what to look for on those. So the original idea that Pritchard had was to use the discarded front section of a sword blade. He had an older pattern uh, British uh, officer's saber, and he had chopped the, the front end of it off, and that was what he wanted to use. And he took this idea and his patent to the Wilkinson Sword Company. And now at this point, during World War I, Wilkinson was pretty much operating at full capacity making sabers and bayonets. Uh, they made a lot of the model of 1917, or pattern of, I'm sorry, the pattern of 1913, bayonets for British rifles. And they looked at this and they thought, you know, w they could certainly do it. Um, and they were legally allowed to do other contract work as, as time was available to them. But they had a couple problems. First off, this looked like it was going to be a lot of work, and they weren't sure that it was really a, a practical, commercial, successful idea. And maybe more importantly, finding the swords to use was going to be a really expensive proposition, because of course they're in a war and they need swords. And you're discarding an awful lot of material to get the front you know, eight inches of a sword blade, and it didn't work out. Let's just put it that way. It didn't work out with Wilkinson. So Pritchard moved along and took his idea to W.W. Greener, which was another British arms company. Now, Greener was actually, at the time, engaged with a bunch of um, arms dealing. They had a bunch of surplus, or had been working with a bunch of surplus arms, and they actually had a whole pile of French Gras bayonets that were surplus. And they took a look at this idea and said, well, you know, it's a neat idea, but what about using the front end of a Gras bayonet instead of this British sword? The Gras bayonets are very cheap. We've got a pile of them out back. And in fact, that actually probably works better. The Gras has this T-shaped uh, cruciform uh, cross-section that gives it a lot of rigidity, and that's what they ended up doing. So they used the front end of a Gras bayonet, and they also used the front end of the Gras scabbard. They'd cut it off here and add this bit, uh, and then also added a leather frog, which is not present on this one. And in total, like I said, they made maybe 200 of these. Um, they were available for private purchase. And what's interesting is when Greener shut down, they went out of business in 1968, going through the factory, someone actually found 
components for these Webley Pritchard bayonets, or uh, Greener Pritchard bayonets, and uh, potentially as many as 50, maybe fewer than that, but it might have been a full 50 of them. And they were wartime production, but they'd never been finish assembled. And a military dealer in the UK actually assembled all of these leftovers and slowly fed them out onto the market. So today, some of these are actual wartime assembly. Some of them are wartime manufacture, but 1960s assembly. And as far as I can tell, there's really no way to tell the two apart. Um, now, there are also a multitude of uh, reproductions and copies, some of which are passed off as just that, as reproductions, some of which people try and uh, sell as originals because these do bring quite a lot of money. So there are a couple things we can look at to make to determine the difference. First off, uh, when Greener made these, they have a patent on them and they also have a WW Greener logo with an elephant and those are both engraved. Now on most of the reproductions, the patent number is there but it's actually stamped rather than engraved and they don't have this elephant greener logo. So that's the simplest way to tell if you have a reproduction. And uh, with some practice, it's not that difficult to distinguish between an engraving and a stamping when you look up close. There are at least some out there where people have uh, added a spurious patent or a spurious company logo to it. So if you see one that has an engraved logo but a stamped patent number, you know that's a fake that someone's tried to pass off as a real one. Just to make things difficult, most of the bayonets, but not all of them, not all the originals, were actually serial numbered. So this is number 147, and that style of, of uh, numbering is, is pretty appropriate for what you would expect to see. So lastly, another good way to just make an, get an initial impression on whether a bayonet is going to be real or not is to hold it by the blade and tap the handle with the scabbard. I don't know if you can hear that through my microphone, hopefully you can. It gives a really nice uh, bright ring and most of the reproductions will give a nice dull thud or clunk. But uh, man, these things are, this is awesome. Now one of the reasons these probably weren't used more uh, actually in the field is that they're not really interchangeable. These are pretty much hand fitted to individual Webleys. So if you bought one of these, you'd have to then take it and fit it to your particular gun. You couldn't just drop it onto any. Now, I pulled this Webley from a later upcoming Rock Island auction, and we were fortunate enough that it mostly fits, but it's very tight. You can see to kind of push that into place. That's how this would normally fit. The back end of the, the hilt here fits around this piece and over that, like so and then you have this cross pin that sits behind the front side of the gun and that prevents the bayonet from moving forward off of the pistol. So when properly set up, they're actually very secure and they're not going anywhere, although they are kind of heavy on the end of the gun. Uh, I would expect if, I, if you get an original, and frankly probably with the reproductions as well, I would expect to need to do some hand fitting to these. So, and of course that's gonna make them a bit less uh, desirable for soldiers in World War I. You know, the idea that you have to actually go and hand fit it, you can't just drop it onto any is not great. Thanks for watching guys. Hope you enjoyed the video. These Pritchard bayonets are really cool. They're really scarce to find originals. You know, if you just want one of these for a Webley pistol to go out and play with and shoot and maybe stab something, reproductions are cheap and easily available and they'll, they're great for that purpose. Uh, however, if you really want to spend the money and have a true original Pritchard bayonet in your collection, well, this might be the opportunity for you. Take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link to Rock Island's catalog page on this. It actually comes with a second one as well, which I didn't feature here. So if you take a look at their catalog, you can see all the details and photos of that second one as well. And if you're interested in them, you can place a bid online or over the phone or participate live in the auction. Thanks for watching.